It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our next speaker, Mark Broyles. Uh, Mark says, the thing you really ought to know about him is uh, he and his wife Judy have three faithful Christian sons and uh, they are uh, pleased with uh, how they have turned out and certainly when we began thinking about speakers for this series of lessons, we thought uh, we would certainly want Mark to do one of our lessons. He's been a preacher of the gospel for so many years, uh, for 22 years in the Kansas City area and recently moved to Bolverde, Texas, a little north of uh, San Antonio. And his life itself, his family, is a testimony to what he understands and knows about marriage. Of course, he also is the president and co-founder of In Light, a uh, not-for-profit uh, that was established in uh, 2007 to help uh, marriages and families develop stronger uh, relationships. And so uh, certainly the subject that uh, we have selected him to speak on about human sexuality is a difficult topic and the cause of a great deal of dysfunction within marriage. And so we look forward to him dealing with this difficult issue in a way that will be practical and helpful to all of us. And I commend your attention to him at this time. Good morning. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to speak, not just at lectures, but on this subject or this series of subjects. And uh, this subject in particular, which is kind of uh, new to me to presenting in this kind of an environment, obviously, but uh, thankful for the opportunity to present this. I was asked by, when I mentioned to the people in Bolverde when uh, I was first asked to come to the lectures this year, people always want to know right off, what's your topic? And so I would tell them that my topic was the spiritual nature of sexuality. And the common response was, wow. <laughs> Do they have something against you there? I, I, I told them certainly did not think so that, that I didn't think they picked these topics on that personal uh, of a level and then I was asked had you spoken at lectures before I said I did I spoke in 2008 when the series was on challenges for our times and I felt very honored because when I was speaking to somebody on the staff at that time they said you were the first person we thought of when this subject came up and it would sure I wanted to be the first person that they thought of. <laughs> this is a difficult subject, no question, and I think part of the reason it's a difficult subject is because uh, we have shied away from it for so long. We, uh, we as brethren, and, and even I would tell you probably the religious community as a whole has kind of stayed away from this. Christianity, if you think of the large umbrella, the way the world would view Christianity, uh, Christianity has either despised or feared the subject of sexuality and how do we make application of that and how do we deal with that biblically and understand. I would give you a list of words to think about for just a moment. If I were to say faith, hope, love, and then I were to add to that list and say forgiveness and sanctification and purity and righteousness and justice. If I were to say, I, I need you to take that list and I want you to put them in the order of their level of spirituality. What would you put at the top of that list? What would you put at the bottom of that list? That would be difficult to, to do because we would think, you know, those are all such wonderfully spiritual things. They're all, all such godly things. But then if I was to take the list and I was to add sexuality to it, my guess is none of us would feel greatly challenged as to where it belongs in the list. Uh, we think in terms of spirituality and sexuality, not necessarily going hand in hand. And we want to talk a little bit about that this morning because much of that thinking has been influenced. Uh, and so as we look at the ideas that are around us, we're going to see that there really are two opposite directions that people go. But I think we're going to see that the same problem is the source of both directions that they go. 
Some of what we are influenced by as a society makes us feel the wrong things about sexuality and about the sexual relationship and intimacy within marriage, and we get a view of it as if it is somehow less than spiritual, it is less than godly, it is, it is something that has a, a dirtiness to it, and we don't want to really uh, get our hands dirty with that subject matter. And some of the some of the writers of old, some of those that are called church fathers, probably had a great influence on that as they made some determinations as to what the sexual relationship was all about. Uh, Augustine, who abandoned a life that was just scandalous, a, a life that, uh, that would take him whatever direction he wanted to go, wherever his lust drove him, abandoned that life for a life of complete celibacy and formulated the idea or the opinion that that was a better way of life, an inherently more spiritual way of life. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, when he wrote about that, when we read that passage that Paul is talking to the Corinthians about, uh, says that now concerning the matters about which you wrote, is it, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. I'm reading out of the ESV. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, each woman should have her own husband. He believed that to be truly spiritual, you needed to be celibate. You couldn't be involved in physical relationships, such as a sexual relationship, even with your wife, unless it was specifically in the act of procreation. Unless you were, unless you were attempting to have children, that you could not have the relations even with your wife. He wrote things like this. He said that it was sinful, yet forgivable. Sexual relationships for something other than procreation, even within the marriage, are sinful yet forgivable. In the good marriage, he wrote, the apostle enjoined them not as a command, but conceded as a favor to have sexual intercourse, even without the purpose of procreation. Although evil habits impel them to such intercourse, marriage protects them from adultery and fornication, for this is not permitted, because of the, uh, but because of the marriage is pardoned. He felt that all of the passion, all of the desire, all of the emotional and physical stimulation associated with the sexual act was as a direct result of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. That it wasn't there before. He couldn't even conceive of the idea that Adam could have felt something, uh, some kind of arousal or some kind of stimulation either uh, emotionally or physically prior to that fall. And he feels in the fall, what happened was it completely changed their nature. And in his words, he said, what it did is it caused man to lose the ability to fully control his sexual organs. And so he said, prior to the fall, the sexual relationship was purely an act of will, never an act of passion or desire, that God created it to be an act of will, not of passion or desire. He said, in marriage, intercourse for the purpose of generation has no fault attached to it, but for the purpose of satisfy satisfying concupiscence, provided with a spouse, because of the marriage fidelity, it is a venial sin. Adultery or fornication, however, is a mortal sin. He went on in the City of God to write, The fact is that this passion had no place before they sinned. It was only after the fall when their nature had lost its power to exact obedience from the sexual organs. He described their relationship as spiritual and that any relationship or sexual relationship that would have existed would have been purely as an act of will rather than an act of desire. That greatly influenced what he taught on 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and what Paul was saying when Paul said, as he did, that it is good for a man not to touch a woman, as some of the other versions say. Uh, I think specifically referring to the marriage relationship. Uh, because I, I don't think Paul would be making a, a defense that uh, there would be any point at, at which outside of the marriage relationship that you could have sexual relations. That would be wrong completely. And, and so I think he's saying with the, in the idea of marriage, is it good to marry or is it not good to marry? I think is what Paul was answering to those brethren. Jerome said, if it is good for a man not to touch a woman, it must be bad to do so. And therefore, celibacy is a holier state than marriage. 
So that's an inherent thing they're saying, that that is a principle that is basic, that it is automatically more holy, more spiritual for somebody to choose celibacy than for somebody to choose marriage. Is it? I mean, is it inherently more spiritual? What was Paul saying that those who are most spiritual, like was the attitude within the Middle Ages especially, as there was a strong drive for those that were separating themselves from society, those that were in monasteries and those who were putting themselves away uh, for and, and living in celibacy, were considered to be the most holy of the people of their time. Are there no circumstances that Paul's talking about? Is there not some kind of qualifiers? Paul's not just making declarations. Paul's answering questions. He says, look, uh, uh, you, you asked me something. I'm going to respond to the question. And so I think Paul is saying that uh, there are circumstances in which becoming married and, and even including within that marriage, having sexual relations and, and then bearing children, that there are circumstances in which that is not a good idea. And the circumstances that they were in under the severe persecution would have been those kinds of circumstances. I think he's dealing with the circumstances that they had. If marriage itself is less holy than celibacy, that would seem to violate the very creation principle. In the very beginning, God created them, male and female, and he put them together in this union. And then when he looked at this union, and that union included the physical relationship as well as the rest of that relationship, as well as the rest of all creation, God said it is very good. It would seem odd that the very first command that God gave man was be fruitful and multiply if that command would have inherently drove him farther away from God. How would God give him a command that would make him less spiritual by obeying the command? Obviously, the scriptures are not pitted against one another. God in the beginning in chapter 2 of Genesis says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That was the standard, what he was looking for as the norm from that point forward, from the very first couple forward. Barnes, when talking about this particular passage, describes that phrase, It is good for a man not to touch, saying, Good in this place means it is fit, convenient, expedient, or it's suited to the present circumstances, or the thing itself is well and expedient in certain circumstances. Vines describes it saying it is goodly or fair or beautiful, as of that which is well adapted to its circumstances or its ends. It seems that Paul clearly is making reference to something that is favorable, possibly even, allowable under any circumstance. Paul tells us and others tell us within the scriptures that that there are some that that could make that choice in life. They may choose to remain celibate. That's always an allowable arrangement. But in this particular time, it seems to even be a preferable not to get married, not to bring children into a relationship when you're under that kind of persecution because of the extra things that he gives you as far as responsibilities and the difficulties of dealing with the society that you're in. It's never praised as being inherently more spiritual. Not only is it not commanded, it's never even praised as being inherently more spiritual. As a matter of fact, the phrase that follows the initial verse there in verse 1, the phrase in verse 2, would seem to point exactly the opposite direction. When it says, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, would seem to me that he's saying, look, God put desires in us, and he understands that. And because of those desires, there are temptations that go along with those desires. And we know the temptation itself is not the problem. The desire is not the problem. James, when he talks about that, tells us that that's not the issue. We all have desires. He says it's when we let those desires go the wrong direction. When they start to conceive, then it becomes problematic. That's when it goes to sin. God put the desires and the drives in us. And he says the norm seems that it would be to be married. Because he says because of those drives, it is better even under your circumstances to get married. And even if that would include children, 
in that relationship than it would be to have that passion burning inside you and driving you to do something that would be unholy under any circumstances. I think the desires that we have, the drives that are in us, the sexual feelings that we have, the arousals that happen in life are God-given, and if we use them properly and understand them properly, we can make them the glorious thing that God wants them to be. But it's a subject that because it is difficult to deal with and because it is in that realm where culture has swayed so far the opposite direction that we kind of shy away from it entirely. We need to help our young people understand that marriage is a wonderful thing and marriage when operated the way that God has said and designed the way that God has said and including the sexual relationships are, are a great thing and as we'll see in a moment I hope uh, point even to better things but then society swings the pendulum the other way Augustine says only for the purpose of procreation anything else is a misuse of the sexual relationship but then what about the society we're in now what about the culture that we're a part of I was having somebody review, uh, looking at some of my notes just a couple of weeks ago for the oral part of this presentation. I said, I may have to cut a couple things out of this. He said, I would cut that section almost entirely because I don't think that there's a Christian in the world that doesn't understand that our society, our culture, has absolutely run amok as far as the idea of sexuality is concerned. But I want to read you just a couple of things. Jessica Booth wrote an article called Eight Reasons It's Okay to Have a Casual Hookup. And she said, here's what I want to make really clear. Having a casual hookup doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means you want to have a no strings attached sex and that, you're, and that you're right. You should never let anyone make you feel bad about this. And then she lists the eight reasons for having a casual hookup. I'm only going to read you one because it's the same one that showed on the top of several lists. She said, sex feels good. And when you feel good, you feel happier, right? That's the problem. Already several of the speakers have spoken about that concept. Our culture that is so self-centered and so selfish and interested in our own happiness and pursuing our own happiness rather than pursuing the godliness that we should be pursuing. Zan, Dr. Zana Vrangelova wrote an article in Psychology Today called Strictly Casual in which she listed the proper reasons to have a casual sexual relationship. Again, number one, she called these autonomous or right reasons. She also listed some wrong reasons, but she had autonomous or right reasons. Number one, wanting the fun and enjoyment. That was the number one reason why it was right in Psychology Today. One other one, James Pfizer. Uh, tells a story about a young girl. She was wearing a purity ring in high school that she had gotten from her parents and had always remained true to that. And then she went to college and she talked about, she remembers the day she took that purity ring off in college and put it in a drawer in her desk. And, and she said, almost from that moment forward, her life started changing. Things started uh, happening that were different than they were before as far as her relationships and where she was going and the things that she was getting involved in. And, and she, she eventually broke the promise that she had made when she put on that purity ring and ended up having sexual relationships with one person and then with several other people throughout the course of her time there. And he said, here's the questions it raises. Is it okay to have premarital sex, group sex, homosexual sex, casual sex, and one night stands? Is it okay to view sexually explicit photos or post some on your, of your own on the internet? The list continues. When couples are married, is it okay to have adulterous relationships, swap spouses, or have more than one spouse? The answer to all these questions is a qualified yes. These activities are morally permissible so long as they are done between, and you could probably fill that blank in, couldn't you, in our culture? consenting adults. That's the only thing that matters. And no one is harmed or exploited. I would tell you, both of these ideas are equally harmful and equally harmful to marriage. Now, I don't think that there are very many of us that have been influenced by Augustine's writings about marriage and hold the position doctrinally that marriage is only for procreation and for any other reason other than procreation it is a sin that can be pardoned within the marriage. I, I doubt there are, there are many, excuse me, or any of us that would hold that position doctrinally. But I think because of what that position was and how long that was presented, that uh, you have a Victorian idea that still now somehow 
as both a reaction to that as following that and a reaction to what we see in culture. You have this Victorian idea that sex is somehow less than holy, that sex is dirty in and of itself, that the sexual relationship somehow couldn't possibly be as spiritual as other aspects of our relationship. Then there's the other side of that, uh, which is our culture that swallows it up entirely, and they think everything is okay, and Christians and marriages of Christians are affected by both, both ideas. I had the opportunity to study because of in light and the marriage retreats and the different things that we do with that I've had opportunity to meet with a lot of couples who are struggling in their marriages I met with a couple that had been married for several years her husband had never seen her naked except one time after several and I'm talking of it was either seven or eight years of marriage had never seen her naked it wasn't because she had esteem problems and was ashamed of herself. She, she felt shame. But it wasn't that she was ashamed of herself or her own body or anything of that sort. She was ashamed because the first time her husband saw her naked, he admired her and remarked about the beauty of her form and her body and how aroused he was by it. And she felt that was shameful, even within the marriage. That she had been raised in, in, in a culture, even though she was a Christian, was raised in a culture that made her feel that sex was dirty, that, that it had been sullied somehow, that there's, there's no way that a man could look at his wife and greatly admire her physical form and still be a spiritual man. And so she wrestled greatly with that, and it caused problems in their marriage. They are still married. But it caused issues struggles that they had to get past for her to try to come to an understanding of what God intended in their relationship and the desires that were there. I dealt with another couple that had, the man had gone just the other side. The wife was unhappy. She was upset because he wanted to role play all the time. He asked her to wear wigs, wanted to watch porn together and share in that. And I was talking to him about that and I said, Help me understand a couple of these things. Why is that? Now, he had been greatly influenced by the things that he had seen. The media he was involved in, and like some of the other couples I dealt with, was involved pretty heavily with the pornographic industry as far as what he was involved in. When I did my, my initial searches for this subject, that's an interesting lesson. Type in sex in Google or sexuality in Google, and there are hundreds of of thousands of sites that it will make available to you. Now, I couldn't open 90-some percent of the ones that it was going to present because I have a filter on my computer that wouldn't allow me to do that, and that's, that's just kind of like a little side sermon for you. If you don't have a filter on your computer, men first, if you don't have a filter on your computer, you're making a major mistake. Just telling you, that's a, get a good filtering system. And if you have children in the home, wow, what an incredible mistake that is. Not to have a strong filtering system that will get rid of that kind of thing. But it was just amazing that you see how much of this comes up. Because we're in a culture that the sexual pleasure and all that, that we want to associate with that is free game for everything. As has already been talked about, uh, even to the point of redefining and redesigning gender. Uh, in our culture. Both of these marriages, I think, both of these positions, I think, suffer from one problem. Seems to be poles apart, but they're both seeing only one aspect of the sexual relationship. And they're both seeing it from a physical standpoint. One is seeing it and saying it can't possibly be spiritual, this, the rawness that is associated with the sexual act. The other one sees it from a physical standpoint from the animalistic side and just says, you know, that's who we are. We ought to be able to just fulfill our desires, whatever they may be. But there's more to it than that. I, I would ask you to consider Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That is two distinctly different things said in one passage, I think. It is saying we were created in the image of God, but we were created in the image of God as sexual beings. Now, God's not a sexual being. We know that. He's a spirit. But we were created male and female 
and yet created in the image of God. Two elements of that. There is a part there that talks about the tie that exists between Adam and Eve and the bond that God intended to exist when they become one flesh, but also the tie that exists between God and Adam and Eve and Adam. And I think within that passage, as well as throughout the scriptures, we're going to find out that for Adam and Eve, sexuality and spiritual, spirituality were not mutually exclusive. They are complementary. They are mutually supportive of one another. God created us in his image and created us as sexual beings. God doesn't treat, the Bible doesn't treat sexuality as if it has been removed from the rest of who we are. It is a part of who we are. We were made male and female. There's no way you could convince me that when God uh, made Eve... Uh, from Adam's rib and she's standing before him and we know they were both naked there's no question that Adam saw the differences and I'm thinking Adam's thinking praise God for the differences he made us with male parts and female parts and I know that sounds crude but I'm saying he made us the way he did as different genders in order to be complementary together in every aspect both physically and emotionally he didn't have to make us that way God didn't have to make us male and female, but he did. He didn't have to make the sexual union as pleasurable and satisfying as it is, but he did. He could have made us so that even if we were male and female, we could have had offspring in some other method, but he did not. He made us sexual beings, and we need to understand that. And I think it's important to understand that when Adam and Eve consummated their relationship, when they became one flesh, God was not shocked or horrified because that's exactly what he made them for. It was the very first command that he gave them. I think that the whole union sexually is as, as satisfying and fulfilling and as inviting as it is because it is the means by which God has helped to create the bond that he wants between husband and wife. And it is a reflection of the loving goodness of our God. It's his idea. Sex is his idea. And he wants us to appreciate and to understand it. I think God wants us to be attracted to him, to be drawn to him. You know, God said things like, oh, taste that the Lord is good. Just come, come to him. I, I want you to be drawn into God. We, sh we should look at God as so attractive to us. We're drawn to him. In Isaiah 55, he said, eat what is good. He says, you know what? You're wasting your time. You're wasting your money on things that aren't ever going to fulfill you. He says, come to me. Come to me. I will give you absolute total fulfillment. Eat what is good. Delight yourselves, he says, in rich food. Uh, that's coming to the table of God. He wants us to be drawn. And I love the way he reflects as how he feels toward us. In Isaiah chapter 62, when we are doing as God wants us to do, when we are living the marriages that God wants us to live, when we're living the lives he wants us to live. He says, God rejoices over you like a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Man, that's a great picture. Almost 40 years ago, Judy and I got married just directly across the street, the old Temple Terrace building. And I can still remember when, when she first came around that corner, I'm already up front, she first came around that corner and she started to walk through that door with her father. The first thing I saw was her clenching onto him with every ounce of strength that she had. So I wasn't sure what the message of that was. <laughs> but she eventually released his arm and came forward. But I remember the vision and that's what I think. Every time I read Isaiah 62, that's what I think. God says, you know what? The way the groom feels when he sees the bride come through that door, wow. God says, that's how I feel about my people when we are living the way that he wants us to live. Now, I think it's because of that entire relationship that the sexual union is a part of the whole that God has made us that becomes so absolutely critical. Some of the other lessons have talked about what society has done and how it has removed what marriage should be uh, and the whole idea of gender. That, this topic is really not dealing with that, but I do think that it's important to recognize that for sexuality to be spiritual in nature, it has to be within the confines and the context of marriage. It 
has to be there. And, and God established it that way because it is a complete fulfillment and a complete bonding between two. C.S. Lewis said the monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside of marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual, from all other kinds of union which were intended to go along with it. He says, well, you've got to make up the total package to appreciate. Think of the words that God used in Genesis 2. Shall leave, shall cling to. The, the idea of continually pursuing. The two shall become one flesh. Those are relationship terms. And God wants us to understand it isn't just a physical act, but it's a physical act within a relationship. And so when he said, be fruitful and multiply I think Adam again is happy. The relationship can be pure and wholesome and we need to help all, but especially our younger people who are heading toward marriage, to understand what the marriage stands for, what the sexual union is all about. Dr. Ed Wheat, in his book, Intended for Pleasure, wrote, God himself invented sex for our delight. It was his gift to us, intended for pleasure. So is it for procreation? Yes. Is it for pleasure? Yes. God created it the way it is, and it is for both. Think about the Song of Solomon. Do you ever feel like Star Trek when you read the Song of Solomon? I, I, I get this, I, I just hear this voice in my head that says, the final frontier. Our continuing mission to explore new worlds, <laughs> seek out new life, to boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> we just don't like the book, generally. It's just, it's not, it's not because there are, it's, it's harder than every other book. It has difficulties, there's no question. But it, we don't like the difficulties. It's not that we don't like difficulty. We don't like the difficulties. It's very open in the way it speaks. It's very erotic in its language. It's, it speaks in terms that, though they don't always make sense to us, no question are very physically focused. In chapter 7, we read, How beautiful are your feet and sandals, O prince's daughter! The curves of your hips are like jewels, the work of your hands of an artist. Your navel's like a round goblet which never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is like a heap of wheat. I've never tried that one with my wife. Some I could get away with. I'm not thinking that one would work. <laughs> Your two breasts are like fawns, twins of a gazelle. How beautiful and how delightful you are, my love, with all your charms. That, that's very physically oriented. That's noticing her body. That's making an appeal as to the appeal of her body. He goes on in chapter 4 to talk about uh, things like her eyes, her hair, her teeth, her lips, her mouth, her neck, her breasts also again, the sweetness of her lips and the milk and the honey underneath her tongue. And he says, let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my, my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink and be drunk with love. No matter whether you understand all the language or not, or the, 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 the descriptions that are used, there's no question as to how physically driven the words are, how erotic they are in the sense of that the appeal is to the beauty and the form of this woman. It was very physical. And it's important for women to understand, God put that drive in man. He shouldn't be ashamed of it unless he's utilizing it improperly. It should be toward his wife. But she shouldn't be ashamed that he has that drive. God gave him the desire and gave her the form. He was the creator of both. And so when the writer of Proverbs talks about letting her breast satisfy you forever at all times, he's saying God made her to have that appeal toward him. There's not a man alive, I wouldn't think, or at least a man who, under, who has read the passage. Uh, where David went up on the roof and you can whatever discussion you want to make about David and what he did after that Is not my point. My point is you can stop right with the first thing that is said and David saw a woman bathing Every man understands the connotation of that David saw a woman who was naked now He made a lot of poor choices after that So if you want to even give him credit and say he was completely innocent to the begin to begin with 
He made a lot of poor choices after. But every man understands we are visually stimulated because God made us visually stimulated. He intended that. He wants, he created the form of the woman in order to stimulate that desire. I need to understand and keep it confined within my relationship with my wife. But he says men are going to have the desire because God gave them the desire. That's a part of how he made us. Male and female, with male and female parts, but also with male and female hormones, which make possible the sexual union and create the sexual desire. But she's not, she's not without that feeling as well, and that desire. She talks about him as being dazzling and ruddy. His head is gold, his hair, his lips, his eyes, his hands, his legs. She says, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go out into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early into the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom, and there I will give you my love. The, the sexual union in marriage is not the marriage. The marriage obviously is much larger than that. But it is a microcosm of the marriage. In other words, it is a gauge to help you understand many things about the relationship. I, I think in a similar way to, if somebody were to ask you, you know, we, we come into environments like this and we bump into old friends and people we haven't seen in quite a while, and, and you might get a question like, hey, what about that brother and sister so-and-so? Are they still faithful? And the first thing that goes in our mind to respond to that question is what? Whether they're attending services. But that's a, that's a poor gauge of, of their true faithfulness to God. At least it should, it's not the first gauge. Other things have happened. If they just quit meeting with the brethren, there are other things that have happened. But I would say, if you could see into the prayer life of other people and truly understand their communion with God on a daily basis, I think you would understand a great deal about their relationship with God, would you not? And I think he's saying the same is true of the sexual union. It's why, invariably, when there are those that have uh, struggles in the marriage and they list the cause of those struggles the sexual relationship is always in the top three and normally in the top two it is a relational and physical involvement and that's important Shanti Feldham and for women only talked about how important it is for women to understand it is it, it is necessary for her to be relationally involved as well not just a submission of body she said, even if they were getting all the sex, this is after extensive surveys, she concluded, even if men were getting all the sex they wanted, three out of four men would still feel empty if their wife was not both engaged and satisfied. He wants to be desired as well. Throughout Song of Solomon, the attraction is mutual, the passion is mutual, the fulfillment is mutual. So is that the purpose? So now the, the, the whole union exists just so I can have ultimate physical fulfillment within the marriage? I don't think so. I think God points to a much higher plane than that, even with the sexual relationship. The marriage itself, and I know others have dealt with and are dealing with that, the marriage itself, according to Ephesians chapter 5, it is a mirror of, and it gives us that picture of a relationship of God and his people, but so, so does the sexual relationship. There ought to be something. If I'm created in the image of God and created male and female and he causes me to have the desires to be physically intimate with my wife, there ought to be something I learned about God in that process. Because every aspect of the way he made me ought to help me understand something about him if I am made in his image. You remember John says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. But then he tells us, so how was God going to connect with man? He sent his son in the flesh he became flesh so that he could become one with us that that is the most intimate knowledge it's, it's impossible to believe that there would be any way even knowing god was om, uh, omniscient before there's no way to picture god could know any better uh, man or be more intimately related to man than he became one and he did and jesus talked about he and the father were one he talked about that he wanted us to be one and us to be one with him like he was with the Father. That, that is absolute intimacy and bonding of relationship. And I think God, when he brings the one flesh relationship into a marriage, part of it is to point toward those things that are spiritual, those things uh, are higher. The Godhead is not composed of sexual beings, but there has to be something in that relationship that gives me a clearer vision of him. And I think it is.
that it is a wonderful blessing that is given that serves to help me express intimacy at the deepest level to another human being so that I might understand something of the intimacy that God intends that I have in my relationship with him. He wants me to be that close. What does our spiritual relationship possibly have to do with our sexual relationship? Just think of some of these words. Both of these relationships centered on trust, closeness, vulnerability, an absolute exposure of one to another, nothing hidden, desire and connection and openness and honesty, intimacy, pleasure, passion. Those words could be used to describe both relationships. And I need to get that connection. It's actually quite fascinating that God would create us in his image and as sexual beings simultaneously. But we need to learn something from that. I think the physical union of our bodies, which to me is the picture of, it's not the only. My wife and I share complete intimacy in many levels besides just sexual. But it is the most intimate that we can ever become as whole beings because of the emotional and physical bonding that exists. And I think it gives us a picture of the absolute total and complete intimacy that will exist when we join our spiritual groom for all eternity. Intimacy will have reached completion. Paul even said things like, you know, there are a lot of things we don't understand here. We talk in terms like that. You know, first question I want to ask God when I get to heaven. But Paul says, we don't, we don't understand everything here. But there, there's going to come a time when it is now face-to-face, -face, intimate, fully involved. And I don't know that there is a better parallel in our marriage of total emotional and physical intimacy than when God chose to give us the sexual union to fulfill that at both levels. And it is pleasing to God not to be a source of shame when we seek to glorify God in our bodies, minds, and our spirits. And that means doing it like Christ did with the church. Nathan spoke yesterday about love. And love is always others directed in that sense. The Godhead never views each other as an object. Never. Everything they do when they relate with one another is out of love, seeking the goodness and the glory of the other. It is self-donation. It never uses any of the others as an end. It needs to be that way within marriage. When I seek in marriage and in the sexual relationship to serve my wife, to nourish and cherish her, to emotionally help her be supported and to, to, to emotionally uh, support her, when, when I drive myself like Christ sacrificially to give myself up for that relationship, when that's my focus, not only in marriage itself, but even in the sexual relationship, then I bring glory to God because it mirrors what he is. And when she submits herself in the marriage and in the physical relationship, God is glorified because it mirrors what God would have us to do. We run a danger of being swallowed up one direction or the other, swallowed up by culture or so disgusted by culture that we get the wrong view entirely. We need to get balance. And the only place to find balance is to let God define for us what sexuality is, what marriage is. Husbands and wives can enjoy the gift that mirrors the very picture of communion and intimacy that the Godhead possesses and that the Godhead designed to be in every one of us. Thank you for listening.